angels. In the name of Jesus, Holy Spirit, we say come in. Holy Spirit, we welcome you in. In the name of Jesus, Holy Spirit, we welcome you in. We welcome you in, Holy Spirit. We say have your way. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Speak in your heavenly language. We're going to break up the fellow grounds because Satan will not rule. He will not reign. He will not abide in this atmosphere. So have your way, Holy Spirit. We say come in. We thank you. He has risen. Thank you for resurrection power. Thank you for your anointing. He has risen. Rise up in power. Rise up in authority. Rise up in your God-given purpose. Hey. Hey. Robo she telebo she ke. Raka ya su torebe. I bind, oh God, the works of darkness. I bind up the prince of the power of air. In the name of Jesus, I bind up the witches and the warlocks. I bind up the sorcerer. In the name of Jesus, I thank you, God, for your blood. I thank you for the anointing. In the name of Jesus, I thank you for rivers of living water flowing in our bellies. In the name of Jesus, we will not live in a dry and thirsty land. I thank you for the abundance of rain. Hey. Take us higher in you, God. We yield. We yield to the Holy Spirit. We welcome you in, Holy Spirit. Hallelujah, God. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will lift a standard against him huh? in the name of Jesus. Huh? Hallelujah. We thank you, God. We cast down every thought, every vain imagination that exhausts itself against the knowledge of Jesus Christ. We pull down every stronghold over this atmosphere in the name of Jesus. We pull down the stronghold over this atmosphere, oh God. We come against, oh God, confusion. We come against the spirit of heaviness. We thank you for the garment of praise. We thank you for the helmet of salvation. We thank you for the sword of the spirit. We thank you, God. We come against every fiery dawn of the wicked one. We come against every fiery dawn of the wicked one. We thank you for the shield of faith. Put on 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 the shield of faith. In the name of Jesus. Put on the shield of faith. Put on the heaven of salvation. Thank you for the God. Thank you for the spirit of the living God. Hey. Robo shetere bo shata. Ramashuko. Thank you, God. We repent on this day. We repent of our sins, oh God. In the name of Jesus, oh God. We thank you for your glory. We thank you for your grace and your mercy on today. We lift up our hands to you. In the name of Jesus. Oh, God, we open up our hearts to you, God. We ask that you purify our hearts on today. Huh? In the name of Jesus, huh? who will ascend to the hill of the Lord? Those who have huh? clean hands huh? and pure hearts. Huh? We want to ascend huh? to the hill of the Lord. Huh? Come on. Huh? We're going to ascend huh? to the hill of the Lord. Huh? We have, oh, God, huh? clean hands huh? and pure hearts. Open up your mouth uh, and give God praise. Uh, give Him glory uh, in the name of Jesus. Uh, hey, 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 we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but principalities uh, and rulers of darkness and wickedness in high places. God has given us, He's given us power, He's given us authority to tread upon scorpions and serpents and over all the works of the enemy. So, Father, I thank you for your anointing. I thank you for your grace. Move by your spirit. 
move by your spirit. Move by your spirit. In the name of Jesus, we thank you for your resurrection power. In the name of Jesus, God, you died and rose for us. You died and rose on the third day for our sins, God. You said that we will have life and that more abundantly, God. So we thank you for that, God. We count it not robbery, God, that you died on the cross. So Holy Spirit, we welcome you in. In the name of Jesus, welcome you in. Oh God, we thank you for the mind of Christ. He said, let this mind that is in me also be in you. In the name of Jesus, we thank you for the mind of Christ. We thank you for oneness, God. We are heading. It is not I. It is not you. It is not us. It is not we. But it's you that live and move and have your being in us, God. Have your way in us on today. Thank you, God. Thank you for your resurrection power. Thank you for your resurrection glory. Thank you for the kabod. Thank you for the kabod. Lord, we don't want to move without your spirit. We don't want to do nothing without you, God. We can't move, God, in you till you come in. So we welcome you in, Holy Spirit. We welcome you in on today. We welcome your presence. We love you. We glorify you on today. We thank you for open heaven in the name of Jesus. I thank you for reigning. Thank you for reigning on this atmosphere. Thank you for abundance of rain. I hear the sound of rain. I hear the sound of abundance of rain. I hear the sound of the abundance of rain. You said it, you said in your word, go back, go back and look again. You said go back, go back and look again. It is here, it is here, it is here, it is here. We thank you, God. We glorify you, God, in the name of Jesus, God. Thank you for open heaven, God. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, God. Yes, God. Yes, God. Yes, God. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your presence. We need you, oh God. We don't want the rocks to cry out. We refuse to let the rocks cry out. So we cry out for you, God. We ask, oh God, that you do a new thing in this atmosphere, oh God. In the name of Jesus, oh God. Mama Shoko, I thank you, God. I thank you just like you sent, even when the donkey was tied up. Loose and let go of my people. Loose, loose everything that's tied up. Loose ha, praise and worship. Ha, loose ha, ha, your promises in the earth realm. Ha, loose ha, your purpose and your destinies. Ha, loose ha, healing. Ha, loose, ha, oh God. Ha, Manifestation, huh? loose huh? deliverance, huh? loose huh? miracles, huh? signs, huh? and wonders. Loose, huh? loose, huh? let the people go.
Jesus. I decree and I declare every yoke of bondage is destroyed. Bands of wickedness is loose right now in the name of Jesus. Right now, I decree it and I declare it by the authority of the one true living God. Hey. So Satan, we say, go back to the grave. Go back to the pit of hell. Every witch I command to fall down in an open grave. In the name of Jesus, we did not come to play. We got work to do for the kingdom of God, and we will fulfill our purpose in the name of Jesus. So we say, come in, King of glory, lift up your hands, all you can, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors, so the King of glory can come in. We will
surrender again. Surrender again. We surrender again. Come on, you tell him. The King of Kings is in this room. Hallelujah. We surrender again. Oh! 
Show up. 
imagine when he was carrying the cross, when he was walking up Villa de la Rosa, how heavy the cross was. But because the word of God says that he turns things around, he makes things for our good, right? He turns them around for our good. So when he's walking up with that cross and the cross is heavy, that walk is very, very heavy. I declare today that that's how heavy he's going to walk in this room for you. Somebody's on their last tear. Somebody say, God, I don't know how I'm going to make it through the rest of this day. Somebody saying, God, I don't know how I'm going to make it through the rest of this year. Somebody saying, God, I may have went buck bankrupt. I don't know how I'm going to get through this. Somebody saying, God, my bills are due. I need your help. Somebody saying, God, my house is on the line. I need your help. So when he walks through the room, walks through the room, don't deny him access. When he walks through the room, don't deny him access. Come on, think about it. When he walks through the room, don't deny him access. That's what the Roman soldiers did. When he walks through the room, don't deny him access. Come on, it's personal now. When he walks through the room, don't deny him access. When he walks through the room, don't deny him access. Hey, God. When he walks through the room, don't deny him access. Come on, that's for somebody this morning. When he walks through the room, don't deny his access. I just want to pause right here. Come on, lift your hands and honor him something. Render him something.
morning, I told my husband, I said, I said, I got to take off my shoes. I said, there was a time that we as believers, we used to get excited about Resurrection Sunday. And because the enemy has crept in into the hearts and the minds of so many men and women of God, we are not even excited about his presence. We're not excited about how he rose anymore. We're not excited about how we can go into the throne room and ask him what we will. That's what the word of God says. It says, come to the throne of grace boldly. It doesn't say shy. It doesn't say for you to be timid. It says boldly. Ask in confidence what you will. We are not excited. There's no zeal anymore. There's no expectation anymore. There was a time when the saints of God used to say, I can't wait to get to the house of God on Easter Sunday. I know we don't believe in Easter, but for so long, that's what you called it. And then when we started saying resurrection, you were excited, but now we're not. yet we want to talk about how he died for us the weight of the cross we want to have this woe is me attitude and he's looking at you and he's saying but I'm still alive I'm still alive that's why his word says man of God it says he won't leave us he will not forsake us. We are his children. He's a father that won't leave. He's a father that won't leave. No matter what you've done today, even those of you watching online, if you have to get down on your knees and say, I'm sorry, God forgive me for not expecting you to perform the very acts in my life. ask him today if you haven't already say God what are your plans for me because his word says that he has plans of good and not of evil even in moments when we don't understand we will never be able to understand what it was like on that road to Calvary we cannot even fathom about that the veil is torn and the doors fling wide I see his glory as I run inside the throne room and all I can do is bow before his presence
worthy. He's worthy to be praised. He's worthy to be adored. I'm so glad that it was good news that, that the veil was torn on behalf of you and I. The Bible declares that the veil, it was rent from top to bottom. Glory to God. Hallelujah. And that's the hallelujah. As the veil was torn. That means that we have direct access to him. We ought to get excited about the fact that Jesus rose. The thing that tried to kill him. Glory to God. Hallelujah. You got to know that the place where he rested is the place that he walked up out of. And I declare over God's people that you will walk out of dead places. That you will walk out of places. That you will be able to give God's name glory. That you will be able to give his name honor. That you will be able to give him praise. He is risen and we will rise. serve a savior that has risen from the grave and you got to know that when God orders your steps that just like he got up be encouraged to know that you will rise from above every occasion you will rise above slander come on you will hallelujah you will rise above insult you will rise above calamity you will rise above hallelujah warfare everything that the enemy comes against you though he comes in like a flood you will rise he rose
want you all to stay in that vein. And I want you to prepare an offering before the Lord. Don't come before the king empty-handed. Hallelujah. The Bible declares every man as he so purposed in his heart. several ways you can give. You can give via Avenue of Cash App. That's Money Sign Contagious CLT. Money Sign Contagious CLT. We also have the option text to give. Text the number 813-308-0638. You can give that way. And of course, you can go and give via the website at www.contagious.church go to the Charlotte location and find Contagious Church Charlotte to give that way we also have an app you can give on the app if you've not already done so I encourage you to download the app we'll go through this one more time and pray and I'll get out of your way We have several options to give. We can give via Cash App, Money Sign Contagious CLT. That's Money Sign Contagious CLT. We can also do text to give. 813-308-0638. Or you can give via the website, www.contagious.church. Whatever God is laying on your heart, give. The important thing is that you honor the king and that you don't come before him empty-handed. Hallelujah. Let's pray over the offering. Hallelujah. Father God, we just thank you for your people. We thank you for the opportunity to give again unto your kingdom. Lord, I just thank you that you blow upon your people as they obey you. God, I thank you that you will cause great increase to hit their houses. God, thank you that even their businesses, God, they shall see supernatural increase because they decided to obey you. You said in your word, Father, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and runneth over, shall men give unto their bo hallelujah, bosom. Let them be the tangible manifestation of your word. We believe your word, we declare your word, and we speak your word. It is in Jesus' name we do pray. And we all said amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. As Pastor Jermaine approaches to mount the pulpit, I just want to encourage God's people and tell you, hallelujah, that the walk that God has ordained you to walk, it will be a prosperous, it will be a prosperous one. Why? Because he goes alongside you. You don't have to go on this journey alone, but God himself has already called you. He's already equipped you. He's already hardwired you with the DNA to defeat, hallelujah, to defeat the enemy. And you got to know that you were made for this. You got to know that you were created for this. And you got to know that God has great plans in store for you and I. Think about this. If death could not hold Jesus in the grave, and the fact that the self-same spirit that rose him from the dead lives on the inside of us. Who can stop the people of God? Who can stop the power of God? Who can stop the anointing of God? You got to know that your walk is ordained by God. Help me celebrate Pastor Jermaine as he comes up. Hallelujah. Come on, we know he's in this room already. I don't need the pump, I don't need the prime. We know he's in this room already. He has made his way in this place. He has let himself be known in this place. He said, I am here, I am dwelling, I am abiding, I am ruling, and I am reigning. I don't have to say a word to let God know that you have to come and he's already in the room.
I love the fact that I don't have to get up here and do too much. I don't have to do a thing. Because we always create an atmosphere of worship that is conducive to what God needs it to be. Not for what we need it to be, but for what God needs it to be. He's a faithful God. He's a faithful God. Let's not take away the fact that he gave us breath in our lungs. That blood is still flowing through our veins. Yes, we know it is Resurrection Sunday. But let's not take away the fact that God woke us up in our right minds. Listen, our bodies are still able. Our bodies are still willing. God gave you good health. God gave you strength. Let's not take away from that. People like to say those are the little things. Those are the little things. But if they are the little things, I don't want to forget about the little things. Because it's the little things that keep me sane. It's the little things that keep me sustained. It's the little things that remind me that God is still faithful. That God is still mindful of his people that he created. He didn't cast us out. He didn't forget about us. And even though we wake up on today to celebrate what he has done for us. We can celebrate the fact that he has given us life in that more abundantly. Hallelujah. I love God. You know, as they were in worship today, um, you know, my wife mentioned the fact that she looked over at me when we was driving. She said, she said, why don't people get excited about Resurrection Sunday anymore? And little did she know, I asked myself the same question yesterday but I asked it a little bit differently I say God I feel a little bit different about this time around I don't know what it is God am I not uh reverencing the fact that this is resurrection Sunday have I lost my zeal have I lost my honor what's going on I feel differently why am I not as excited as I usually would be God is saying, you don't have to get excited about one day because you celebrate me every day. You wake up every day and acknowledge the fact that I have risen out of the grave. You put it that way, I said, okay. All right. <laughs> but I want to live my life in such a way that people know the God that I serve every single day. I don't want to wait until this day and dress up in the Easter suit and, and everybody's looking at me and how I'm dressed and how I'm coordinated. Listen, I don't care about any of that. I want every day you wake up, even if it's a bad day for me, I want you to still know that God is still faithful in and through my life. Every single day that I wake up, I want it to be evident that God is real. So as you know, we're talking about the walk today. It was amazing. Oh, they were singing, Hold, this is holy ground. And I looked over at the kids, you know, they were talking. And then I seen my, my three-year-old daughter. She was just like off in the distance singing, this is holy ground. And you know how you look at kids and they get on nerves. And I looked at her, she was like. <laughs> but she was still saying the words, but she just wasn't saying it out loud. But it was just amazing to see that out of the mouth of a babe that she can acknowledge the fact that this is holy ground. So I don't have to get too excited about today. I'm already excited, but the fact that my child is singing about holy ground. That's amazing to me. So the walk, I'm going to try not to be before you too long. The walk. Turn with me in your Bibles to Luke 19. As I've been preparing my messages as of late, I've been praying and asking God, Lord, I know I read the same scriptures over and over again, but God, I want you to show me something different in the text. I don't want my preaching to be cliche. I don't want my preaching or teaching to sound the same. But God, I want you to really show me your word. I want the words to jump off the page. And I want you to reveal something to me that I've never seen before. So this may be a little bit different approach today. But we're going to talk about the walk. Luke 19. Apologize for my voices. I was out there cutting grass for three hours. You know what them allergies get. So pardon me. Luke 19, 28 through 38. 
And it reads, I'm reading from the King James, so if you hear words you don't understand, it is still scripture. And when he had thus spoken, he went before ascending up to Jerusalem. And it came to pass when he was come nigh to Bethpage in Bethany at the mount called the Mount of Olives. He sent two of his disciples saying, go ye into the village over against you in which at your entering ye shall find a coat tied whereon yet never man sat. Loose him and bring him hither. And if any man asks you, why do ye loose him? Thus shall, say, thus shall you say unto him, because the Lord hath need of him. And they that were sent went their way and found even as he had said unto them. And as they were loosing the colt, the owners thereof said unto them, why loose ye the colt? And they said, the Lord hath need of him. And they brought him to Jesus, and they cast their garments upon the coat, and they set Jesus thereon. And as he went, they spread their clothes in the way. And we as come nigh, even now the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed be the King that cometh in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Father God, we thank you for this time, God, that we get to spend in your presence. Lord, I believe that I'm just your vessel, God. I pray that you would use me, God, as your voice box on today, God, to allow your word to penetrate even the depths of the hearts of your people in this room, God. Let this word transform. Let this word revive. Let this word renew and let this word set free in the name of Jesus, God. We bless you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So I want to come from two thoughts today. We're in a series called The Walk. So the first thought I want to come from is the walk that carries the Messiah. The walk that carries the Messiah. Just to kind of give you a little bit of background, paint the picture a little bit of what's happening. You see, Jesus and his disciples were heading to Jerusalem for Passover. We all know about this feast. This is a feast that everyone came to celebrate every year. Once a year, they came down to Jerusalem. So you have to imagine it was multitudes of people and, and a multitudes of animals that were coming in these caravans to Jerusalem. And this is the time where they're acknowledging the feast. We all know back in Exodus when he said to take the blood of the lamb painted on the doors and the death angel will pass over. And it's a celebration of what God is going to do, bring them out of Egyptian bondage. And, and this is a significant thing that has taken place because not only are Jesus and his disciples headed to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover, but they are literally walking with the Passover lamb. But yet they still miss it time and time again. And you see what happened prior to this, a couple of verses back, you see uh, Peter, James, and John, they got to experience what's called the transfiguration, where he took them on the mountain, and he began to transfigure himself, and they, they seen him in all his glory, and then they seen Moses and Elijah stand there, and then he began to testify with them, and you know the story, I don't have to read it all for them, but they got to ex experience this that happens, but this is amazing to me as I read scripture, all of these different events that take place to show that Jesus was the Messiah, and yet people still missed it. Then Jesus begins to inform his disciples of his incoming death. He said, listen, I'm going to be betrayed. They're going to take me. They're going to arrest me. They're going to beat me, all that stuff. I'm going to go to the cross. And yet they still didn't understand what was happening. Then Jesus began to have this discourse with his disciples, and they begin to ask them, who's the greatest in the kingdom? It's, it's crazy how they come and ask them these trivial things. Who's the greatest in the kingdom? And he says, listen, bring, bring one of the children here. Let me explain something to you. He who becomes like this child is the greatest in the kingdom. You guys are fighting because you want authority, and you want position, and you want rank in the, in the kingdom. But bring one of the children here. He begins to say, he who becomes like this child She'll be the greatest in the kingdom. And then, and then they begin to come again and say, listen, okay, if my brother does something to me, how many times should I forgive him? If he sins against me, I mean, should I forgive him one time or, or you think five, seven times good? No, 70 times seven. And not only that, but he's having this discourse with his disciples. Here come the Pharisees. We know the super religious folks. Here they come testing Jesus. And they had to have this dispute. They say, uh, Jesus, they, Moses uh, uh, allowed for divorce. So uh, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? And it's crazy the things that they're coming to Jesus with. 
Is it lawful? I'm not going to go into that whole situation, but that's what the Pharisees were bringing to his attention. And then after that, he begins to tell this parable about the rich young ruler. We all know that one. Then he begins to tell another one about the laborers in the vineyard. And as I was studying for this, I was like, excuse me, I was like, Lord. I see all of you, you know, because when I read scripture, I like to read verses and, and chapters behind to really set the tone as to what is happening. And I'm seeing all of these things transpire. And I'm like, Lord, what is going on here? It, it, it's, it's amazing to me the fact that your disciples and the fact that the Pharisees are coming to you at a time that is the most critical in your life. Jesus, as your heart is getting heavier, the more and more people are pulling on you. And that began to resonate with me because sometimes when I'm just going through, it's at that moment that people want to pull on me. It's at that moment where people want to call me. And it'd be just the dumbest stuff that people want to ask you about. Oh, can you pray for my knee? Can you pray for my cat? I don't know what's going on with my cat, but my cat needs to be the most trivial things. Well, my heart is the heaviest. And if I look at my earthly mind and I and I tried to make sense of it it doesn't compare or equate to what Jesus was going through I am at the hour where I'm about to be put on a cross where I'm about to be scourged where I'm about to be beat I'm about to be criticized and you want to come and ask me who's the greatest in the kingdom is at this time where he's like listen you guys don't understand the intensity of this hour, and yet you come with the, the little stuff. Can I divorce my wife? So we're going to talk about the walk that carries the Messiah. And as we read in here, this talked about Jesus going, asking his disciples to go and get a donkey so that he can ride into Jerusalem on. So he didn't want to walk into Jerusalem. He had to ride into Jerusalem. But I'm going to explain that to you. So they come to this area called Bethpage. If you guys don't know what Bethpage is, it is the house of figs. Remember, anytime you see Beth in text, it means house of. And the word that follows means what it means. So Beth Page means house of figs. And they, they come to the place called Beth Page. And it's funny because this is the only time that this area is mentioned in scripture. And then they come to the place that's near it called Bethany. Remember, house of affliction or sorrows. I want you to follow me because I'm going to go somewhere with this. House of affliction or sorrows. The Lord dropped something in my spirit, and it may be a reach. It may be a reach. But I feel like the spirit really was trying to show me something as I was preparing myself for today. They came, he said, go into an area called Bethpage, and there you should find a coat tied. The house of figs. Man, this is amazing when he revealed this to me. When you look back in the garden of, of uh, uh, the garden back in Genesis, and we see what happened when they sinned against God, right? Their shame was exposed, right? Their nakedness was exposed, right? And what did he tell them to do? What did he do? He took the fig leaves and sewed them together. He covered their shame with fig leaves. He says, I want you to go to the house of figs. I want you to grab the coat that is tied, and I want you to bring it here. Why? Because back in Genesis, when mankind sinned against me, I covered their shame with figs. But this time around, I'm covering the shame of this world. Go into the house of figs and grab the coat. So I said, Lord, this has to be symbolic because this is the only time that this city was mentioned in Scripture. Figs, Bethany and Bethpage, they were cities that were adjacent to each other, but they were often used synonymously. So he tells them to go into this city and get this donkey. Why do you want us to go and get a donkey? Of all animals that are in this land, you want us to go and get a donkey. Has anybody ever seen a donkey? Have you seen one in person? Listen, I'm from New York, so I haven't, like, seen animals like that. But when we went to the farm one day, like, I was kind of scared. I mean, you don't go tell nobody that I was scared to look at the animals, even the donkeys. I was scared of all of them. I, I just never been that close to an animal before. So that was just different for me. 
I was out of my element. But I began to look at the horses, and they had zebras there. And I said, that's pretty cool. Just don't get your hand in there. Okay, we saw the giraffes, all this nice stuff up close. Uh, this is mind-blowing to me, man. This is crazy. I ain't never seen a farm a day in my life until I came out to the Carolinas. So we go to the farm, and, and then I, I began to see this donkey that's just roaming around. And that is an ugly animal. That is one. Y'all ever seen what a donkey looks like? I mean, his face is just so big. His nose is all stuck out. Eyes is all big looking. Listen, I seen a donkey for the first time, and I was like, this is, this is ugly. So I'm like, why do you want them to go and get a donkey for you to ride on? Why can't you go send them a horse? Or why can't you go send them for a camel? Hey, why can't you even ride a cow into the city? I don't understand why it has to be the donkey. And God began to reveal to me that it, God isn't interested in our looks. He isn't interested in our intelligence. The way that we dress ourselves and adorn ourselves. He's not interested in that. So I began to put myself in the place of the donkey. The walk that carries the Messiah. And I began to look at myself. I don't look the best. I don't sound the most intelligent, the most wise. And yet God still chooses to use me. So if you in this room are one who was called out for God's purposes, God is not concerned about the way that you look. He is not concerned about the way that you talk. Because God wants you to know that he can still use you regardless. Remember, we know someone in the Bible who had a speech impediment. We knew someone in the Bible who didn't think that they had the intelligence to be able to even help people understand what God was trying to say. But God is not concerned with our looks. He is not concerned with our intelligence. Just bring me the donkey. You see, the Messiah wanted a humble entry. He said, I need to come in with humility. Bring me a donkey. Anybody ever watched the presidential inaugurations? You ever seen those? I want you to see something here. What is an inauguration? An inauguration is a transfer of power. It's a transfer of power. But what do they ride in these inaugurations? They have this fleet of limousines. You know, they're bulletproof and all that good stuff. But the one that the president rides in is called the beast. How much does this beast cost? $1.5 million. Why does it cost $1.5 million? I'm glad you asked. I'll tell you. They have five-inch thick bulletproof windows, eight-inch thick aluminum plating. The doors alone weigh as much as a Boeing 757 aircraft. The tires are Kevlar reinforced run flat tires. They will never go flat. Do you hear what I'm saying? This beast costs $1.5 million, but the whole inauguration costs $100 to $200 million. You mean to tell me we're going to spend $200 million for a transfer of power when our Savior said, I want to come in the most humbling way that I can? Go and bring me a donkey. I don't want it to look good. I don't want it to smell good. I don't want it to sound good. Listen, I don't want people to look at the donkey. I want people to understand that I'm the king, that I'm the Messiah, that I'm the one that's coming to redeem. I'm the one that's coming to restore. But we make it about us, spending all this money for this triumphal entry, just to transfer power. How many years can a president serve four? In total, how many years can a president serve eight? In total, how many years can our Messiah serve? He will last forever and ever. There is no king that would ever dethrone him. There is no transfer of power. He took the power when he came into Jerusalem. He said, I'm taking the power of death. I'm taking the power of the grave. I'm taking the power of sin. The transfer of power to come into me. The Lord had great need of this donkey that was tied up in a place of affliction. Today, I want you to put yourself in the place of that donkey. This donkey was tied up 
And in a place called Bethany, which is the house of affliction, the house of sorrows. You see, because in the midst of our sorrow and our affliction, the Lord has great need of us. That's why you can't give up. That's why you can't throw in a towel. That's why you can't say, I don't want to do it anymore. Because it's at that moment in your greatest sorrow, in your greatest affliction, that God is saying, I have need of you. I am sending for you. I know you're tied up. I know you're joined with sin. I know you feel like you can't win this war. You can't win this battle. You can't win this race. But God is sending for you because he has great need of you. Put yourself in the place of this donkey. Another thing, that this was an ordained moment in time. Everything that Jesus did, he fulfilled prophecy, right? This was an ordained moment in time. Zechariah 9 9. It says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon a donkey and upon a colt, the fowl of a donkey. You see, Jesus was fulfilling prophecy the whole time. So the minute that he said, Go and fetch me a donkey, it should have triggered, it should have snapped on in their mind to say, Oh, this is is the Messiah. This is the one that was prophesied about. I'm a part of a moment in time where prophecy is being fulfilled. That would have been a time for me to rejoice and to be excited. Oh, you couldn't have told me nothing. The minute that he said, go and get that donkey, it would have clicked. I would have said, oh, this was prophesied. This moment was spoken about. I already know what's about to happen. I'm rejoicing. Prophecy had to be fulfilled. The Lord wanted to remind you today that you have been marked with a prophecy to do God's work. The donkey was marked with a prophecy to do the Lord's work. From the beginning of time, this donkey was marked with a prophecy to do the Lord's work. From the beginning of time, you have been marked with a prophecy to do the Lord's work. Okay, Pastor Jermaine, what do you mean? Ephesians 2 and 10 says you are the workmanship of God, created unto good works. You have been created as the work of God to do the good work of the Lord. Before time began, God knew that you was going to be tied up. He knew that you was going to be in a place of affliction. He knew that you was going to be in a place of sorrow. He knew that you was going to be in a place where you felt defeated. And he was going to say that I am sending for you because you were created to do my work. Understand the importance. Another thing that he revealed to me was that some things happen the way that they do in our lives because prophecy has to be fulfilled. I know we question God and we yell at God and we, we shake our fist at God when it just doesn't feel good in our life. When, when we don't hear him, when we don't sense him, when we don't feel him, we want to cry out to God. We want to get mad and yell at God as if he's doing something wrong. But God is saying, I prophesied that moment when you was going to open up your mouth and yell at me. I prophesied that moment when you was going to curse me out. I prophesied that moment when you was thinking about turning away from me. Why? Because I have great need of you. There was a reason why you went through exactly what you went through because it was prophesied from the beginning of time. That's why we have to stop fighting God. Even in our rough times, we have to stop fighting God and feel like God is not there, that God hasn't left us. If you believe God in his word, if you believe what he said, I will never leave you and never forsake you, it doesn't matter how hard it gets. It doesn't matter how rough it gets. We have to understand that God has a purpose for us. You were called out of darkness. You were given a marvelous light. He is not going to take that light away because he who has light has the light of life. And if God has given you life, he is not going to give you death. Why? Because he defeated death. 
You were created for a purpose. He orchestrated your path. He ordered your steps. He knew exactly where you would be, even in this very moment. I can't read your mind. I don't know what you're thinking about. I don't know what you're suffering through. But I want to let you know that on today, he has called me to tell you that he is sending for you because he has great need of you. It was prophesied from the beginning of time that at this very moment, I'm going to untie you. I'm going to loosen that chain. And I'm going to bring you to where I need you to be. To carry me. The Bible also says that the Lord rode on a young colt. We watched this. Uh, no, I don't want to say it because y'all going to talk about me. Well, I got kids, so it's okay. My kids... Wanted to watch this horse movie. What was it called? Dreamer. It was a really good movie. Though. I'm not even going to front. It was a really good movie. Kids went to sleep. I'm still watching it like, what's going to happen? What's going to happen with the horse? But um, so I learned about horses and, you know, the, the, the terminology, you know, fillies and coats and, and all that stuff. So I'm not going to pour you guys with that. Go watch the movie. <laughs> I'm not going to make fun of you. But um, the Lord rode on the young coat. But there was something that happened. They bought both of the donkeys. So you had a mother and you had a young colt. So there was a lot of dispute and debate. Of course, theologians go back and forth about this. Well, did Jesus ride on two donkeys then or did he ride on one? If you really read the text, I believe that the spirit will reveal it to you. But he didn't ride on the mother. He rode on the young colt. Like I said, I want to make this resonate with you on today. The Lord has need of those who think they're not ready to be used. He didn't ride on the mature, grown, adult donkey. He rode on the young donkey. You're going to carry the Messiah whether you think you're ready or not, whether you think you're equipped or not. God is saying, you're going to carry me. You see, that, that, here's an amazing thing. Thank you, Holy Spirit. It is in those moments where God can really do what he needs to do in our lives. Because think about it. And when we get so mature, when we feel like we're so wise, we start getting a big head and thinking that we can do and say whatever we want. But he says, listen, I'm going to use this foolish thing to confound the wise. I'm going to sit on this young colt. But the mother thought donkey walked alongside her colt. Man, it's amazing how the Spirit will reveal stuff to you. So even though he rode on the young colt, the mother came alongside. What did God say to me? He said, God will place the right people around you to walk you into the purpose that God has for you. So you won't have to walk alone, whether you're not equipped, whether you're not ready, whether you feel like you ain't got it all, you ain't know it all. I believe that God will send the right people to stand in your corner, the right people to stand behind you, to push you into the fullness of your potential. That's why you can't get discouraged. That's why you can't get disheartened. And that's why you can't get dismayed. Because I believe that at the right moment, the right people are going to come and say, listen, I believe in what God is doing in your life and I just want to push you I just want to pray for you I just want to help you along this journey the mother coat came right along Jesus told him to take the disciples Jesus told his disciples he said take the donkey without the owner's permission you got to imagine what they think wait 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 run that by me again you want us to go and, and, and take the donkey without telling them that I ain't doing that. You going to do it? I ain't doing that. I, I, I ain't doing that. No, go and, and, and take the donkeys. Loose them. And if anybody asks you, tell them to come to me. No. If anybody asks you, tell them that the Lord has need of it. So I'm taking something without the owner's permission. Oh, this is about to get good to you. There was a story about a man named Mario Murillo. He was a 
a new convert. He was like a babe in Christ, but he was on fire. You know how we are when we first come to Christ. We on fire. We want everybody to get saved. You can't have no tattoos. You can't have no long hair. You better take those earrings. You know, we get super religious when we first come to God thinking that we know it all. But really, it's just our zeal. We're just on fire for this newfound faith. So they had this man named Mario Marilla who was just on fire. He believed that the Lord was just talking to him, that the Lord was speaking to him, and everybody thought he was crazy. He's like, no, I believe that the Spirit wants me to go here. Oh, the Spirit told me to go and Dunkin' Donuts and get the glazed donut. Not the, not the donut with the sprinkles, but get the glazed donut. But everybody's looking at him like, man, this dude is crazy. This dude is out of his mind. But it's amazing how when we are on fire for God and believe that God is speaking to us, everybody thinks that we're crazy. But the more that we mature in our faith and stop hearing from God, everybody thinks that something is wrong. So this man had this bike that he, had, he used for a method of transportation. He got around and around on this bike, you know, a little huffy with the, uh, with the pegs on the back, you know, that good stuff. You know, he rode his friends on a handlebar, you know, the fun stuff. Y'all don't know nothing about that. So he had this nice bike he rode around, and one day he went outside to go get his bike, but his bike wasn't there. Somebody stole this man's bike. So he was discouraged, and they're like, well, what is the Lord saying to you now? Who took your bike? <laughs> Where did your bike go? Oh, I, I knew it. You wasn't. Everybody talking about this man. So he was walking. Everywhere he went, he walked. Everywhere he went, he walked. Until one day, the Lord spoke to him. He says, listen, I want you to go down there. It's about a five-mile walk. I want you to go to that gas station. Don't ask no question, just go to the gas station. So he's, he's questioning God, like, you sure you want me to walk five miles to that gas station? What am I going to this gas station for? He just walked. He got to the gas station. He saw a bike, and the Lord said, take the bike. I'm about to take nobody's bike. He said, take the bike. No, nah, okay, I, I believe that I was hearing you before, but now you telling me to go take this bike without asking someone's permission? No, I'm not, I'm not up for that. I'm not doing it. The Lord said, take the bike. So he took the bike. He hopped on that thing and was gone. I mean, just, just out of there, you know, on that bike because he didn't want nobody to catch him. It wasn't his bike. So then he got home and he was like, he felt so bad. He was like, Lord, I just, why did you have me steal this bike? I just feel so bad. I didn't even ask for permission for it. This is not even my bike. And he got mad. He gets mad and he throws the bike down. And when he picks the bike up, the paint is scratched off. And he sees that it was his bike the whole time. The person that stole the bike just painted over it. So, God, no, the man wasn't crazy. God was saying, listen, you took your own bike. Somebody took it away from you. But I told you to go and get it because I knew at this very moment where exactly it was going to be. When he tells them to go and loose the donkey, don't ask no questions. Just understand that there is a purpose and a reason. We don't know if he has some kind of arrangement with this person. We can't ask questions. If he says just go and do it, we obey God and just go and do it. It doesn't matter who or what has ownership over you when the Lord needs to use you. When the Lord needs to use you, he is not asking for, for permission from your sin. He is not asking permission from your guilt. He is not asking permission from your trauma. He is not asking permission from your hurt. He is not asking permission from your pain. When the Lord has need of you, he's going to use you. He is going to sin for you so that you can walk and carry him. Another thing that the Lord revealed to me was about leaders. We all call ourselves leaders in this room, right? We're leading somebody. We're leading something, right? But he says that leaders train others with hopes that God will use them to do greater things. Leaders train up other leaders. Not so that they can be even with you on the same level as you, but so that they can do greater things than you can do. So you had to imagine that the owner wasn't going to say anything because I believe that this owner believed in Zechariah 9.9 where he said that the Lord was going to come in a donkey. He was just waiting for the moment for the Lord to come and get the donkey. I know it's going to be my donkey. I know it's going to be my young coat. I'm just waiting for the moment for the Messiah to come and, and, and search out this donkey and grab this this donkey that is tied up. Listen, I want to tell you on today, if you are a leader in this room, when God has need of the people that you are leading, you better let them go. 
let them go. Don't hold on to them thinking that you're the only one that can impart into them. When God has need of somebody, you better trust and believe that God is using them to do greater works than you. You better not get intimidated and you better not get mad because God has great things. The Bible said in John 14 and 12, greater works shall ye do. If Jesus can tell them that greater, you should do greater things than I'm going to do. What makes us think that we can hold on to the people that we're leading? So I ask this question, do we carry the Messiah in our walk? Can you put yourself in the place of that donkey and say that I carry the Messiah in my walk? And if you do, where do you carry the Messiah? Do you carry the Messiah in your job where people are getting on your nerves? Do you carry the Messiah in your family? Do you carry the Messiah in your businesses that were created to represent and reflect him? Or is it about us? Remember, the riding on a donkey was a humble one. Can we get back to a place of humility where it's not about us, where we don't have to be seen, where our name doesn't have to be called? All we have to know in our heart is that no matter what, I'm carrying the Messiah. No matter what, I'm staying true to who he called me to be. No matter what, I'm not backing out of his word. I'm not backing out of his truth. He has molded me and shaped me into the image of his son. No matter what, I'm going to walk in humility, and I'm going to carry the Messiah. And I want to talk about the walk that carries the cross. See, as we see all these things that Christ endured before he got to the cross, he was betrayed by one of his own, but he knew it was going to happen. Betrayed with a kiss. This is the one that you are looking for. I'm going to kiss him on his cheek to reveal to you all who he is. We have to imagine what's happening here. Because Jesus is like, I just washed your feet. I just allowed you to eat bread and drink wine with me. And you have the audacity to kiss me on a cheek. I want you to think about all the things that he is enduring. He faced conviction. They said he is guilty of crucifixion when he did nothing wrong. He's looking at these people and saying, how? How can you say I deserve this when I came to do this for you? Not only was betrayed and convicted, but he was condemned to death. Criticized. He went through Roman torture. I dare you one day just to look up what they did to Christians. They tortured them beyond measure. You can only imagine what they did to Jesus because of who he claimed to be. They didn't just torture him like a regular Christian. No, they had to go above and beyond. They had to make it look even worse. Not only did he go through the Roman torture, he went through the Roman scourging. They put the crown of thorns on his head. Imagine a crown of thorns being stuck on your head, driving through your skull. If the torture wasn't enough, I'm going to put this thing in my head. They beat him. 39 lashes. And they would have kept going. Scourging. Beating. Criticized. Ridiculed. Spit on. Punched. Everything he did for them. Uttered not a word. And took everything. So because of that, I want my walk to carry the Messiah, and I want my walk to carry the cross. Really quick, Luke 23 and 26. I want to show you something. I'm going to get out of your way. Luke 23 and 26. It reads, and as they led him away. They laid hold upon one Simon a Cyrenian coming out of the country, and on him they laid the cross that he may bear it after Jesus. I don't know about you, but I've searched this scripture in and out, front to back. 
I find nothing mentioned in this scripture about this man named Simon. That's how you know that there's something significant. When Beth Page was never mentioned, there's something significant. When Simon the Cyrenian was mentioned, there was something significant. Don't miss this. Cyrene was a place in northern Africa, now known as Libya. Simon was a Jew of African descent who was coming to celebrate Passover. Little did he know he was going to meet the Messiah. Simon helped carry this crossbeam. I mean, just imagine, he's just coming out of the country, just walking, la da 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 Hey, you! Yeah, you, come here. Carry this cross. Carry this cross. Just imagine that at the moment that you're not even thinking about God, you're not even thinking about the Messiah, you're not even thinking about your faith, at that very moment you get called out, you! have need of you, carry this cross. So if he can get picked out of a crowd just minding his business, I don't need to fight God when he picks me out of the crowd minding my business to do the work that he has called for me to do. You see, this guy was taken away. Listen, this guy was taken with the other, 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 um, other authors stated that they took him and made him do it out of his will. We fight God when God does something out of his will for us. Simon had no say in the matter. But he says, I need you to carry this cross beam. We know he didn't carry the entire cross, just the cross beam. And it was stated that that cross beam weighed over 100 pounds. You mean after torture, after scourging, after beating, after beating, after beating. Now I have to carry this 100-pound cross beam. You see, but Jesus couldn't do it. He got to the point where it was just too much for him. And they said, listen, we have to get somebody out of the crowd to help him out because there is a plan that we are trying to execute so he can't fail here or else we fail in our plans here he come coming to celebrate Passover unknowingly now he ended up carrying the cross with the Passover lamb I'm just coming to celebrate the feast and now I get to carry the cross with the one who I'm carrying the cross of the Passover lamb. I'm looking him in his eyes. I'm seeing his hurt. I'm seeing his pain. I'm seeing the blood trickle down on his body. I'm seeing the tears that's coming out of his eyes because he knows that all of this is for a reason. All of this is for a purpose. And here I come, minding my business. I get the opportunity to carry this cross into Calvary. You see, if Jesus didn't make it to Calvary, then prophesy, prophecy couldn't be fulfilled. Jesus had to make it to Calvary. See, the Romans and the Pharisees, <laughs> they thought that when Jesus fell and that cross beam fell on top of him and they saw that he couldn't make it anymore, they said we need to get him some help so that we can finish out our plan. But little did they know they wasn't finishing out their plan. They was finishing out God's plan because God had a plan from the very beginning. So even though Christ got on one knee, even though Christ got on two knees, even though Christ laid down and that cross beam fell, when Simon came along and picked that cross beam up, God was saying, yes, it was at that this very moment where I'm using a man who was just minding his business to fulfill the plan that I have for my son. It's crazy how sometimes the enemy has control over your life and he thinks that he is fulfilling his plans, but sometimes God will use the enemy to execute and fulfill the plans that he has for your life. He used their plans against them. You want to get him to Calvary because you want everybody to see that you hung the Messiah up on a cross. But I want you to get him to Calvary because there is a work that has to be finished. He has to hang on his cross because he said, send me and I'm going to go. And when he said, send me, I'm going to go, he submitted to the will of the Father. So whatever the Father said he was going to do, Jesus said, I submit. Not my will, but your will. So I have, I have to take this cup that I'm not listening 
and this cup is not going to pass. I'm going to drink this cup. If I got to take the torture, I'm going to take the torture. If I got to take the scourging, I'm going to take the scourging. If I have to take this crown of thorns being stuck on my head, I'm going to take it. If I got to take this very moment where I can't make it anymore, I see Calvary down the way. I'm walking down this Via de la Rosa. I see where I have to go. I can't make it, but I know because I submitted to the will of God, I have to make it there. Prophecy has to be fulfilled. God wants to empower his people today. And knowing that he wants to use you, the one that nobody knows, the one that's in hiding, the one that people have forgotten about, the one that people have cast out, the ones that people have disregarded, the ones where where people said, "You're you're not enough, you're not smart enough to stand at this pulpit. You're not smart enough to hold a management position. God wants to use you to fulfill the plans that he has for you. But he wants you to walk out your faith by carrying the Messiah and carrying the cross. It doesn't matter where you are. You have to ask yourself that question daily. When I wake up in the morning, am I dying to myself? Am I picking up my cross? And am I following after Jesus? I have to ask myself that question every day. Am I carrying the Messiah? Am I living in his truth? It says if I can preach the word, I must live by the word. So not only am I preaching it, am I living by this word? Is my life a living testimony? Am I overcoming by his blood? Am I overcoming by my word? Listen, I want you to ask yourself this question every day. Am I carrying the Messiah and am I carrying his cross? It doesn't matter who you are. Even if you're not confident in yourself, if you're not confident in your own abilities, I want you to understand that God has great need of you. I want you to be like that donkey when he calls for you. I want you to just go. And when he lays those garments on top of you and he sits on you and says, listen, I just want to abide with you. I want you to take me in to where I have you going. Are you willing to die to self? Are you willing to crucify your flesh and say, I will carry you, God. I will carry you, Jesus. I will carry your cross. Whatever I go through is not going to defeat me. I'm going to carry you from earth to self, from one side of the earth to the other side of the earth. He came with a triumphant entry. And I close. He said, send for me a donkey. Send for me a donkey. I want this to be the most humble, humble approach. And as they came in, as he came in, they threw the the branches. They took their garments off. They threw their garments in a road. Surely this is the Messiah. I believe that there were people in this audience, in this congregation, who knew what was happening. So on today, as we celebrate what happened to our Savior, I want you to go back. Sometimes the reason why we may not be excited about this day is because we haven't gone back far enough to see all that Jesus went through. To see all that Jesus endured. Don't just look at the cross. Look at everything that transpired before the cross. He wanted to testify of who he was. He wanted to reveal to the people who he was. Though you deny me, I am still going to show you who I am. Though you slay me. Though you convict me. Though you condemn me, you can't say nothing ill about me because you saw me do the signs. You saw me do the miracles. You saw me do the wonders. You saw me deliver. You saw me set free. You've seen it all. So when I went to the cross, you should have known that I was the one from the very beginning who was set out for this moment to hang here. Can only imagine what he was thinking about when he was hanging on that cross. 
I know that he was thinking about the future, but I'm pretty sure that he was thinking about the past too. Even back to the very moment that he says, do not eat of that tree. And they disobeyed and did it anyway. I'm pretty sure when he was on that cross, he saw what took place in Genesis. He said, this is why I'm doing it. Because I created a people who are going to be used to fulfill the great works that I have for them. So I want to encourage you on today in knowing that no matter what it looks like, no matter how much hell you face, does your walk carry the Messiah? Does your walk carry his cross? See, we don't have to carry the bloody cross. We carry the cross of victory because he said, it is finished. When he gave up his spirit, he said, it is finished. He looked over everything over the cross of life and he said, it is finished. No longer does there need to be another sacrifice. No longer do they have to carry the burden and try to figure out will they make it into heaven or not. I did it once and I did it for all. I hung up on this cross for you. I hung up on this cross for you. I hung up on this cross for you. So the least that we can do is wake up every day and say, because you did it, I'm going to do it. I'm going to carry my cross. I'm going to carry you wherever I go. I'm going to take you in my family. Though they talk about me, they don't like me. I'm still going to reflect an attitude of Christ. I'm still going to look like you. I'm going to sound like you. I'm going to walk like you. I'm going to talk like you. It doesn't matter what they do to me at my job. I'm still going to reflect Christ. It doesn't matter what they say about me at church. I'm still going to reflect Christ. I'm going to carry my Messiah. And here it is before I open up this altar. Jesus rode into his death with peace on a donkey. And I questioned him, why did he ride on a donkey? Don't worry about the fact that I rode in on a donkey. I want you to understand that I'm coming back on a horse. For war for everlasting life for you. You see, Jesus, did you hear what I said? Jesus rode into his death on a donkey, but Jesus is coming back on a horse to ride us in to eternal life. Death is going to be defeated. Sin is going to be defeated. Hurt is going to be gone. Sorrow is going to be gone. Grief is going to be gone. Guilt is going to be gone. Pain is going to be gone. He says, I'm coming on a real triumphal entry. I'm coming for war to defeat everything that was holding my people back from understanding who I am. Came in on a donkey. Coming on a horse. So today my question to you, I don't know where you are in your faith journey. I don't know where you are in your faith walk. But can you put yourself in the place of this donkey? I'm not going to chastise you. I'm not going to criticize you for how you lived your life. But I believe at this very moment, you can make a decision to say, Lord, my life hasn't always reflected you. I haven't always lived as humble as this donkey. I was trying to be the horse every time. But God, today I get it. Because I understand the importance of what Jesus did for me. And I understand that you have need of me. So God, I just want to rededicate my life to you. I want to make a new commitment with you on today. I want to stand before you and make a new covenant with you on today. I want to plead. I want to take an oath before you and say, God, from this day forward, I will carry the cross. From this day forward, I will carry you. Let nothing rob you of what God has for you. He has purpose. He has a destiny. He has a hope and a future for you. And I want you to receive all that God has for you. 
Jesus didn't die in vain, but he did it for you. So for those of you in this room, if your prayer today is God, I want to make that commitment again to you. I want to be on fire like I was when I first gave my life to you. I feel like the fire has died out a little bit. I don't feel on fire like I was before. I don't feel like my giftings are strengthened the way that they used to be. God, I need a refreshing from you. I want to recommit. I want to rededicate. I want to stand before you, God, and say, listen, not my will, but your will be done. And this altar is for you. If you've been in a place where you felt defeated, you felt like that donkey when he was tied up in a place of affliction, you're in a place of grief and sorrow, and you feel like, I just can't take anymore, God. How much more do I have to go through for you to send for me? I believe that today God is sending for you. This is the time where God is saying, I am sending for you. I am loosing the rope and I am taking you to where I need you to be. If that is you, this altar is for you. If you're in a place and you're saying, listen, I've been praying and praying and praying and I can't do this alone. I need someone to stand with me in prayer. I don't know what you have need of. I don't know what's burdening your heart. But I want you to come today and lay it before God. And I want to stand with you and believe that you shall walk in the fullness of your potential. Into the triumphal entry of your purpose and your destiny. So if that's you today, it's all just for you. Please come. If that's you. If you need prayer, we have people here at the altar that can pray with you, that can stand with you, and that can believe God with you. Don't leave this place with the same mindset. Don't leave this place holding on to that sorrow and that grief. Don't leave this place holding on to that affliction. You have the opportunity to let it go. You have the opportunity to let it go so that God can use you as his workmanship. This altar is for you. This altar is open. Come. Come if you need prayer. I worship you. I worship you. You are here mending every heart. I worship you. I worship Miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. We make a miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here, touching it. I worship you, I worship you, you are here, healing every heart, I worship you, I worship you, you are here, turning lives around, I worship you. I worship you, you are here, mending every heart, I worship you, I worship you, we make a miracle work, a promise keep, a light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Make a miracle work, a promise keep, a light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here, moving in my midst, I worship.
worship you. I worship you. You are here working in this place. I worship you. I worship you.
Hey! 
declare that in the atmosphere. Say, let all the other names Come on, loud as you can today. Let all the other names Let them be like sand in the wind. Let all the other names fade away. Let the enemies of your life fade away today. all the other names Come on, declare it in the atmosphere. Let the enemies of your life fade today. Let all the other names fade away.
free.